Hey, you ever feel like your computer's pushing you around, always trying to tell you what to do? I'm Merlin Mann from 43folders.com, and today I'm going to show you how to stop accepting defaults today on The Lab. Good to see you. Welcome to The Lab. I'm Leo Laporte, and this is the show where we help you with your technology woes. We show you how to buy technology, how to use it, how to lose it when you're done. Ladies and gentlemen, the lovely Kate Abraham. Hello. Hi, Kate. We are coordinated today. I didn't plan Look this. Look at that. But we did, this is Purple Day on <laughs> the show. Uh, we've got some great stuff. Actually, we've got Ray Maxwell here, Mr. Color. Yes. He's going to show you how to take a photograph and turn it into a line drawing that's very compact. Okay. They call it vector art. I, I don't know how he's going to do this magic somehow. Merlin Mann's going to show you how to tweak your meatballs. He's Is that what he said? Tweak your meatballs. Tweak your meatballs. He's so funny. No more accepting meatballs. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Well, oh, defaults. <laughs> oh, that's different. I love Merlin. He's the greatest. He's a, my, an old friend. Oh, not speaking of old friends, Chris Krug is back, yeah. and he's going to show you. There, he's actually doing work with China now, and how technology is bridging yeah. the cultural divide and the uh, political divide. It's just fascinating stuff. That's coming up. We got a great show. Lots of calls too. In fact, busy, let's get our busy. first call of the day. Indeed, we are going to Davidston in Quebec, and we have Dennis on the line. Hello, Dennis. Thank you, Kate. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Leo. How are you, sir? Very good, and you? Very well. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you today? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I have videotaped a friend of mine on a Sony DV camera, mm -hmm. and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to produce a CD from the audio. Just the audio? Just the audio. So okay. I'd like to put it through something, some sort of equalizer to set the levels, and then I'd like to be able to record it onto a CD, and I've been having major difficulties finding programs to use for that sort of thing. Mac or Windows? Mac. My first suggestion is, uh, before you do anything the audio, is take it out of the video. Um, and uh, there are a number, of, there, are, there are kind of lots of free programs you could use. Do you work with video a lot? Uh, I, yeah. I'd say More spend, this is my strong suggestion, and everybody I know who works with video does this, spend 30 bucks and upgrade QuickTime, this is Mac or Windows, to QuickTime Pro. Quick Pro okay. uh, once you up, notice that uh, this is the unupgraded version of QuickTime. Sean, we need to upgrade our version. <laughs> so when you buy, when you are, actually when you open your Mac and you've got QuickTime or you download QuickTime on Windows, you'll see that some of the features are, are grayed out and they say Pro. These are all things that you'll get. <laughs> if you pay for it. It's only 30 bucks, but the part that you're going to really like is that you can export. Now, of course, I can't do it because it's, we, haven't, we haven't paid for it. Actually, we have a license somewhere. We just have to enter it in. Uh, we can export the audio only as an MP3 or AAC or WAVE or whatever format you want. And so you can open your movie and just save out the audio. There it is, the audio track. Now you can EQ it. Now you can edit it. Now you can burn it to CD, all of that stuff. The pro there are a number of good programs um, you can use to uh, edit the audio. Do you have an audio editing program you use? Uh, I don't have a, uh, just basically the one in Final Cut. Well, that's fine. Soundtrack Pro is like the high-end stuff, so if you're comfortable with that. If you have Final Cut, you have QuickTime Pro. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, uh, I have Final Cut Express. Can't yeah, that doesn't come with soundtrack. Um, and I can't remember if it gives you an upgrade automatic. It should for the price, but anyway, if it doesn't, it's worth paying the 30 bucks. A couple of good programs I would recommend. This is one very good audio editor called Fission. It's from Rogue Me, but they do really neat stuff. This is simple to use, straightforward, uh, not very expensive, 32 bucks. Here's another one that I really like. It's called Amadeus Pro. I, I just happen to know a little bit about audio editing programs on the Macintosh. Uh, this is from Herrorsoft, another $30 program. This does multi-track, which I like. All of these will allow you to save it out as MP3. And then if, if you don't want to spend any money and you're willing to put up with something that's a little rocky or not quite as uh, durable, Audacity is good. Audacity.sourceforge.net. This is Mac and Windows Audacity. and Linux Audacity. And that's absolutely free. Um, but there's three good programs. So I would say do spend the 30 bucks though to upgrade QuickTime. If you work with video at all, QuickTime Pro is, is really a, a fantastic program. Now, Sean does have a couple of, you want to show? Oh, you can do it on I, yours. I do have this on this. It's not hooked into our, our switcher. 
Oh, and Kate has and it Kate as well. It. So all of you have upgrades except yeah. me. I'm the one who's playing with the unlicensed version. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very simple. You just save it out. You can save it in almost any format. Kate's going to show you. There it is. So it's under save as, or I'm sorry, export. You can export to almost any format. Yeah, I definitely recommend this as well uh, for video users. We actually use this for rendering out all of our different versions in, uh, in, for, for Lab Rats when we do this. We, yeah. we take one master file, render out DivX, so, Windows yeah. Media. And if you just wanted the audio. Right, you can do, you, do the audio Do you ever as well. do just MP3 audio with Lab Rats? Uh, we have someone else do that for us with a different uh, tool, but we could do that Certainly as well. Certainly could do it, yeah. All right. Thanks for the call, Dennis. I hope that helps. Yes, it did. Yeah. It, Thanks it, very much. If you do a lot of, I use Final Cut Express too, by the way, and I, I'm very happy with it. I don't feel the need to buy the $1,300 Final Cut Pro, or Studio, I guess they call it. Express is great, and uh, but but it's but it's worth spending a little bit more uh, to get a QuickTime Pro. It just does so many things. It can, you know, you can. I mean, it's just a little good little toolkit to have. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Hey, coming up, you know, there are two kinds of uh, image formats in general. There's bitmaps, where there's a dot for every, you know, color or, or, uh, or shade. And then there's something called line drawings, vector drawings. Flash, for instance, is vector-based. The advantage of vector is it scales beautifully to any size, and it's much faster. Can bitmaps be turned into vectors? Ray Maxwell says they can, and we'll show you how. A great way to save size when the lab continues. Stay right here. Our old friend, our great friend Ray Maxwell is here. He is an electronics engineer, color scientist, a teacher, a speaker, photographer. He even uh, flew a, a glider in a Super Bowl commercial. I didn't That's know right. that about you. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Today we're going to use uh, show how you can take a, a, a photo and turn it into vector art. Now, there's your last caller. I just want to give one hint. You can save the 30 bucks if you buy... Uh, Final Cut Studio for fifteen hundred dollars. Yes, you get it free. You get it free. <laughs> what a deal! Such a deal. Yeah, I was trying to remember Final Cut Express, and I don't think they do no. include that. They don't no. bundle that. You only paid three hundred bucks. You don't get the free QuickTime. Right. Yeah, I know. It's such a deal. Such a deal. So uh, we we have a nice, a lovely photo. Of a me. lovely photo. Oh, now it's these your are these birthday are what you call party. bitmaps or raster. Images, this right? is. I'm in Photoshop right now, mm -hmm. and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we can turn it into artwork, posterize it. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same thing in Illustrator and show you the difference. Okay, good. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this lovely, lovely picture. Thank you, Ray. The man of a thousand faces <laughs> and ten thousand voices. A scary face. We're going to go in here and we're going to posterize Leo here. And let's uh, bring it up to maybe uh, six levels or so. And we've posterized it. Now that's still a bitmap, though, isn't it? A dot that's for every dot. That's still a dot. Right? And so if I go in and blow that up, you see it's pixelated. We see yeah. all these little pixels right. and so forth. All right, now I'm going to switch over to Illustrator. And another Adobe product. Another Adobe product comes in the Creative Suite. If mm -hmm. you buy the Creative Suite, this is in it. And I'm going to go in and place that same image, that bitmapped image, into now, did you do the posterize? No, the original raster. Okay. Right. This is the original raster image, and I'm going to take it here, and I am going to scale it. Raster and bitmap are about the same thing? Yeah. Interchangeable? Well. <laughs> I know if I ask Ray, he's going to give me the technical answer. No, they're not the same. They're not. Raster, each pixel has bit depth, 8, okay. 16 bits. That's how many different eight, colors can yeah, be represented by that dot. A bit map only has ones and zeros, and it's the final file that goes to a printer or oh. um, so forth. Now, so bit it's map bit, always be black and white? That's right, and it's only, only zeros and ones. Literally, black and white, no black gray. Black and white, no gray. But uh, it's been misused so many times, right. and then Windows came out with the BMP format, right. and they extended it to include raster, okay. and so it's been horribly confused. So raster means there's one dot for every dot on the screen or on the uh, photo, right. and then there is a, a certain number of colors that that dot can Colors be. are gray shades. Right. 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 Okay. Bitmap, officially, What's back in the beginning. What's a vector, then? A vector is all of the things that you see in a picture are described as mathematic Bezier curves. Lines, Lines curves, curves, squares. Squares, yeah. Okay. So now we've brought your picture in here. And we're, you're going to lose some quality, aren't you, when you oh convert yes. this all the lines? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to do something artistic with your... <laughs> with your. So I'm going to go into Trace, and I'm going to go into Tracing Options. And they have a bunch of defaults here. And I'm going to start with Color 16 default. 
And so I'm in color mode. Now I'm going to just bring this up a little bit so we can see this. And I'm, uh, I'm going to be in the color mode rather than black and white. And I'm going to increase the colors to, it'll use 24 colors in doing okay. this. Okay. So it's only going to have 24 colors in its palette. And I'm going to say, okay, let's trace it. And I'm going to turn on preview here. So essentially now it has to create a point for every point in the curve. So you're going to see a lot of dots on this thing. Right. We're going to do all kinds of tracings here. And I'm going to bring this over here to the side well, we've now. We've lost some color, but the picture itself looks pretty yeah. much the same. And now in addition to this, I'm going to say, OK, so I'm happy with that. Else, so yeah. I'm going to say trace. Okay. And then I'm going to go back out here so I can see my menus. And I'm going to go in. I have to convert this to a live paint object to do what I want to do next. And you can do that in one step if you have the presets, but I'm doing it in two steps right. here so you could see those You can set it setups. up at a time yeah. so it does it all automatically. Now, I'm going to do that same super zoom in as soon as we finish here, and we're going to have a look at what we've created using this technique. So let's zoom in. Will we have the... Oh, you see? Look at that. Now we have the same so little really features. regions more than they are pixels now, yeah? Right. Now, if I go in here with the select tool, I can grab one object in here. You can, like, grab a, a layer of the cake and I see And it. each of these areas is defined by a curve. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So this, the advantage of this now is you can scale it as much as you want. You can make right. it as now, as you want. As I am going to keep going in here. Look at that. It's smooth. And I'm it's now at 6,400%. I could put this on a billboard right. and wouldn't lose a thing. So right. I can scale it to any size that I want. I can print it out. It isn't rasterized. If you send this to a printer, it isn't rasterized until the final stage because all things in this image are, des are described by mathematical... And, and, uh, curves. and uh, of course, in order to print it, they have to convert it to a raster, uh, to right. dots, because otherwise the printer doesn't right. know. But so, they may do that at 6,000 DPI. Right. They can control the size and then right. print it. It doesn't get converted until that very, very last stage. Can you do it with all the color that, that it would normally have, or do you have to kind of lower the color quality? Well, you can do it. The only thing is you get so many paths and so forth that the you file starts, dots. it starts to get as big as a raster file. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, so this is a smaller file, too. Oh, yes. This is a much smaller file. Uh, so that's that's another reason. Right. Could you now, you could probably bring this to flash, and now this could be a flash object, which yes. you could then later animate, because right. you have, you could have handles and grab stuff. That's right. Very you interesting. Go in and get the individual is, is Illustrator the best way, the only way to do this? Well, there used to be freehand. Right. And, but Illustrator's pretty well taken over the world, and you can do some of this in Photoshop. You can put in paths and so forth. By hand. By hand. But if you want this automatic tracing, it's in Illustrator. Right. If you only wanted a little bit, like the piece of cake or the fork or my nose, you could just try Trace that around and get that as a vector of That's object, right. pull it out of right. the main painting and do it that and way. And you can put those vector objects back into Photoshop. Oh, interesting. Okay, onto, in, over a raster image, and you so keep it in go. a separate layer. I was incorrect in calling it a bitmap, although that's colloquially what they call it now. Yep. It's a raster versus a vector, and now you kind of know the difference. Thanks to Ray Maxwell. You can see Ray's photos and learn more about him at his website, maxwellmultimedia.com. Thanks, Ray. That's cool. That actually did a better job than I thought it would. Usually the automatic tools yeah. don't no, do so. It that's, does an incredible that's pretty job. impressive. Yeah. Speaking of incredible jobs, Sean Carruthers, he's amazing with his macro lens. He's zoomed in on something you'd find around the lab. What is it? What could that be? Boy, I tell you, you know, when you zoom in that close, everything looks different. I have no idea. You got an idea? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll zoom out and find out when the lab continues right after this. Stay here. Welcome back to the lab. Before the break, we uh, showed you this with an on-off light uh, in a tube. I don't know. What is it? Let's zoom out. Oh, it's the Wowie Robo Quad, of course. Sean took that with his new Super Duper Macro on his Rebel Canon Rebel, his XTI. You like it as well? I do. Yeah, the Evolt's good for those macro shots, but uh, I like the Canon. It's, it's all in the camera. lens. It's, it's all, all the about the lens, way. isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Hey, let's say hi to Kate and get another caller on here. We are going to Brown Mills in New Jersey, and this is Mike. Hey, Mike. How's things in Jersey? How you doing there, Leo? I'm very well. What can I do for you? Okay. Uh, this is a hard drive problem that... I, first time I've come across it, it's a Dell laptop. Yeah. Um, 
and it has a password. As soon as you boot the computer up, it asks you for a password. Okay. I've, I've taken the hard drive in and out of the computer because uh, I have an adapter where I can turn it into a mass storage device. Uh, it won't let me format it. It won't let me erase it. So, e so it's not a BIOS password. It's not the password you get when you turn on your computer. It's attached to the hard drive itself. Uh, that's what I'm thinking, but yeah. in the BIOS, it gives you the option to set the uh, hard drive password. It yeah. specifically says that. We, uh, you know, lately uh, we've seen a number of new hard drives that have built-in encryption. They actually have a chip on them. Steve Gibson's talked about that on the show. But this isn't that, I don't think. How old is this system? Um, I mean, it's got Windows XP Home on it. It's, you know, it's a few years old. Yeah, so those, those, hard, those built-in encryption hard drives are pretty new. People don't know this, but the ATA spec, the IDE hard drive spec, actually allows for locking. And so you can lock a, an ATA, ATA hard drive. Uh, and it can be, when it's locked, it's hard to unlock it, frankly. Uh, you can't take it out of the machine and put it on another machine because it's not tied to the BIOS. It's not tied to the operating system. It's the hard drive. Now, fortunately, uh, there is a program you can use to unlock it. Okay. Uh, you can either get it from rockbox.org. Uh, they discovered this when they were working on hacking the Arcos, the Arcos uh, uh, system, which is those. Let me zoom in on this because it's awfully small. The Ar Arcos system uh, has a hard drive that's locked, apparently. So they wrote this tool. So you can get this directly from Rockbox. It's ATAPWD. Um, and download it now. The problem with that is you have to have another system, of course, to run this on. There's another way to do it, the Ultimate Boot CD. Let me go there real quickly. The Ultimate Boot CD is a free CD, which probably everybody who uses Windows should have. Uh, it's, a, it's a bootable CD with, with, with you know, hundreds of free, useful tools on it. Not, not pirated, but these are all free tools like this ATDPWD that you can run. And it comes with ATAPWD on it. So what you'll do is you'll, you'll, excuse me just a second here, my computer wants my attention. If I can get to this site, I don't know why I can't, for some reason it's slow. It's ultimatebootcd.com. You, you boot to the Ultimate Boot CD and one of the things on the menu is ATA password unlock. And it should unlock that hard drive. Okay? Now can I do this out of the laptop? Or do I have to put the hard well, drive? Well, if back the laptop will boot to a CD, that's the best place to do it, yes. Okay. And most, most computers will boot to a CD. So, oh, so, yeah, yeah, it'll yeah. boot to a CD. Yeah, because I tried a sure. number of. Uh, that's how you install Windows. From boot.com and so right. forth. And Ultimateboot.cd.com. It's the same program you would get from Rockbox. They just put it on there. Oh, okay. But this is, as far as I know, the only way that you can unlock this uh, drive using this ATA locking. Um, yeah, you're right. It's not very commonly used. And, and, and there's no, I tried everything. Well, Plastic, yeah. BIOS, right. um, everything. Yeah, and no, was, you can't. Yeah, this is the only way I know of to do it. Now, this won't work on these newer drives that have the built-in encryption chip. As far as I know, there's no way to get, that's why they started, they moved to this encryption chip, because it's even more secure. Oh. But I don't think you have one of those because they're brand new and they're expensive. and They come on some Lenovo machine, stuff like that. These, you know, I think they're from Hitachi. These, this is probably using the standard, you know, ATA's always had this ATA. I, you know, it's rare that you see somebody use it, but that's probably what. Did you buy this drive from somebody? Uh, no, I, I, I'm fixing it for a family friend. Okay. That's how I got into this because... He probably um, used the... Able, he probably... Back to school. Yeah, he probably thing. saw this locking capability in the BIOS and said, well, that sounds like a good idea. Right, and then they forgot the and password. And they forgot the password, <laughs> which happens all the time. That seems like a good idea until you forget the password. Well, try this anyway. Ultimate Boot CD, it's free. It's, it's a good thing to have. If you're the kind of guy, which obviously you are, who people come to and say, can you fix my computer? You ought to have this. There's a number. I, I have a toolkit, a number of Boot CDs. I have a Spinrite disk, I have just a number of Boot CDs so that I can immediately start working on a computer, even if it's not booting. And right, this is one. I got that one. I got, I got a bunch. Yeah, well, then you might even have this one already. Already, yeah. I might. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's one of the. one favor. Yes, sir. We don't get you here in New Jersey. Nobody anymore. gets me. I know. <laughs> but, I mean, I've watched you for years. I Thanks. know. I Tech TV, I'm asking you for a copy of one of your autographed books. Any one. Oh, I can do that for you. 
Let, uh, hang on the line. They, uh, I don't know if they have my address or not. I know they have. Yeah, hang email. on the line. We'll get your address. I don't normally do this because I, you know, I, I haven't written a book in a couple of years, so my supplies are dwindling. But I do have one. I'll send you. I'll be glad to send you. I'd appreciate that very much, Leo. And. Uh, it was a great talking to you. I hope this solves my problem. Nice to talk to you. I hope so, too. Let me know. Send us an email because I'd like to know. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Now, let's take a walk over here because Sean's got a, a shiny. A shiny. Wait, wait a minute, Sean. Wait a minute, Sean. I, I know you're getting old. You Probably your memory's not as good as it used to be. We've done these. We've I done know. these. You know what? Callie Lewis so showed us the Evolve yeah, speaker set from Griffin them. Technology. Isn't this neat? So these are wireless. They're, they're, wireless. they're charging on here. Mm -hmm. And then you play your, uh, mm -hmm. play your iPod. Mm -hmm. And In fact, I remember we had video of you walking off with this at Showstoppers and walking hundreds of feet away. So yeah. you see, we really have seen this already. We have seen them. Yeah. But here's, here's the problem. You've got these speakers right now. Right. You've got them you know, somewhere in another room sure. from this. Yeah. I'm listening to the iPod. Yeah. You know, right. This is in my den. I'm listening in the kitchen while I cook my pasta ragu. And, and, uh, and, right. What happens when the battery dies? Well, I have to go back and put them back on the charger. Do you, though? No, what? There's a... <laughs> there. We have Whoa! something. Oh, hey, that's been, a great idea. They're calling these the hot plate. So, so now I can leave this in the kitchen, keep these charging, leave this in the den, and I, uh, I, have, I could, can I even buy more cubes? I probably could, huh? Well, in fact, <laughs> I can buy more cubes. <laughs> Look at that. So, so now, this is the Evolve add-on yeah. set. Does it come with the cubes and the hot plates? Well, you can buy them separately by speaker, or separately together. by charging okay. plate, or together in okay. a bundle. So cool. they're about three bucks for the charge plates each. Three? 90, That's yep, not bad. Ninety-nine bucks per speaker. Per speaker. But you can get two speakers and two charge plates for two hundred bucks. I love Griffin. This Evolve system is really great. And now that they have this kind of satellite. That makes it even more attractive. Right, and the nice thing about it, it all uses radio technology to, to broadcast, so it'll all be in sync no matter where you are. It's not using digital and reconstructing oh. it. So you can add as many of these as you like. So it's like having a little radio station in your house. Exactly. Oh, how, and it goes pretty far. It goes pretty far. Pros and cons? Pros and cons, well, you can add as many speakers as you like, and it's really easy. All you got to do is put your new speakers on the original setup that you have, and it'll automatically tune to the frequency. And you can buy them in piecemeal format, so you can buy them as you want them. What's the negatives? Well, the negatives are is you can't control the volume individually. Oh, even so only one right. setup for volume, okay. You can actually use the remote control to, to change the tracks from a remote speaker by pointing oh. it at the speaker, but you can't do it one by one. Oh. And it can be pretty expensive uh, doing these one by one by one. So like everybody's setup, listening to the same thing yeah. at the same level. Hey, but yeah, but you know, you do it a little bit at a time and yeah. it's like an investment. Yes, yeah. so we're looking at $500 here, but if you do wow. it in piecemeal, as you say. Okay. Very good. Actually, for four, for two two rooms, four speakers, five hundred. Not, not bad. bad. No, it's not bad. Thank you, Sean. Hey, coming up in just a bit, my good friend Merlin Mann from Forty Three Folders. He is going to show us how to ignore the meatballs. What defaults? I'm sorry. When the lab continues, you stay right here. Oh, wait a minute. Let's do a quiz. I want to test your knowledge. How much floor space was there for exhibits at the 2008 Consumer Electronics Show? I'll give you a hint. It's so big they have to hold it in Las Vegas, the only place in the world that can can sustain this kind of square footage. Half a million, 637,872,000 or 1.85 million square feet. What's the right answer? We'll talk about it when the lab continues a little later on. Stay right here. Welcome back to the lab. Leo Laporte here. There he is, the lovely, the talented, the clean-shaven Merlin man. New papa. Hey, Merlin. How's it going, Leo? Great to talk to you. Merlin is uh, the uh, creator and editor and host of 43folders.com, which is a fantastic site on productivity. He speaks everywhere. I saw you just spoke to Google about uh, using your time wisely. I think that's cool. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I think that's a mix-up. Merlin's also the most uh, self-deprecating guy I know and a regular on our a podcast Mac Break Weekly. We love having him on uh, that. So we're going to talk about, I'm, you know, I, every time we've had, I talk to you, Merlin, I ask you for advice. Uh, I guess I'm not taking your advice very well because events are overwhelming me still. So please help. What can I do to streamline my existence? You, we're going to talk today about meatball settings. Yeah, that's right. Actually, that's, that's correct. I think one of the things that you learn uh, after even a few weeks of using a computer is how much stuff you can kind of tweak out and set however you want. Right. And uh, you start to learn the kinds of things that uh, you want to leave alone and the kind of things that you want to make a little bit more your own. So, so I thought we talk about a few of the things that uh, kind of the pitfalls we want to look for in the defaults in our life. Some of the default settings are not optimal. So where do we start? I'll tell you, I'll tell you my favorite one right now. I've been thinking about this one a lot. Have you ever had like a super quick question that you had to ask somebody, like a 30-second question? Yes, all the time. 
let's say you want to have a phone call with them to ask them a 30 second question. Do you have iCal there? Can you open I iCal? do. I have iCal right here in front of me. Why don't you go ahead and create a quick event uh, to ask them the 30 yeah. second question? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's create an event. I'm going to call it a conference call. I'm going to say, uh, call uh, Merlin. Oh, gosh. Uh, huh. And so does that go to like a 30 second uh, length automatically? No, automatically. It's, uh, I'll, be I'll be talking to you from 11 a.m. till noon. Okay, that works for me. We'll probably go ahead and <laughs> the rest of my life. <laughs> so, no, you know, it's just a huge deal. Probably not. I mean, an hour is a good length of meeting for a lot of so, people. So, how do I say? How do I save? Uh, how do I change this default length to something? What would you suggest? First of all, fifteen minutes. Well, first of all, I think the, the best way to change it is to call Apple and make it so that you can change it. Oh, yeah, there's, no, us, there's no setting here. It begins with a certain amount of mindfulness for just saying, you know, in my life, I'm going to start saying in my own head, I'm going to always change that to 15 minutes. And yeah. if I need to make that longer, I will. I can't believe they don't have a default uh, setting in there. You know, right. I'll tell you something, Leo. Uh, Gmail, which is a very popular, or uh, rather GCal, the Google Calendar I use program. Google Calendar. In fact, I learned from you how to, how a program called Spanning Sync that will sync my Google Calendar with my uh, iCal, so I use that. And in fact, I now have a, a program on my BlackBerry that automatically on the over the air syncs my Google Calendar. So that's really, really handy. Yeah, so, that stuff's getting a lot better. And, and I think that's one of the good parts of the default is when you can put something in place where you don't even have to think about it anymore. Can I change my default in, uh, in the Google Calendar? I'm sorry? Can I make oh, this no, a 15-minute meeting? No. Now you can't change that either. <laughs> but, you know, there is consistency in that they're both defaulting to an hour. You know, that's ridiculous. They really should say, you know, how long is the default meeting? And I don't, I don't almost always, I don't want to meet for an hour. I don't need to meet for an hour. Well, I mean, here's the, here's the dirty little secret. The, the real trouble behind that is not just the fact that one at a time we're losing an hour. It's the fact that an entire generation of people is growing up around the idea that when you create a meeting, it takes an hour. Must, must and be so an hour. In addition to wasting time, it's a really unhealthy habit to allow you, yourself to internalize that. So if I'm going to say call Merlin, uh, I'm going to change that now. Instead of uh, saying, uh, you know, I, you could change how, how the pop-up on how it reminds you, but they don't, I'm not, by the way, the default on Google Calendar is all day, not one hour, which is even oh, more really? annoying. That's a nice, that's a nice fix. I'm going to meet with, I'm going to meet with Merlin all day. All right, I'm just going to meet with you for 15 minutes. I can block that out. All day, that's the default. All right, I'm going to save that. Okay. So ways that we can do this. I mean, you know, the thing is, I think the first step is becoming aware of it and starting to realize when you're allowing a default to take over your life. For example, on a Macintosh, which I love, we now call it a Mac. Uh, everybody loves the dock. The dock is a great way to have instant access to all of your stuff. But after a while, it starts to feel a little bit almost like some kind of a, a, a pinball machine or a one-armed bandit. And so one of the great things you can do on a Mac, if you're in the Finder, I believe the command is just Option, control, or, uh, option Apple D can make your dock disappear, which is a great way to say, you know what, I, just, I don't need all this stuff taking my attention away. I need to be able to focus on one thing at a time. So are you saying turn hiding on, or are you That's saying... Fine. That's a, that's a confusing wording, I think, to yeah. turn hiding. So, so right now, my dock is always there, but if I do Control-Option-D, it hides. You see that? And what, uh, now, you say, well, where's my dock? Well, when you move the mouse down there, it, it'll come back. That's exactly right. And, and again, I think it's really important to say it, with, especially with the Mac, that this is, uh, this is an OS that is, has been designed to be tweakable um, and to make it easy to kind of get it the way that you want. So I think once you find yourself using an application, if there's an application that you're using a lot, yeah. I, I think it's a really good habit to get in the habit of opening up the preferences and seeing what and finding you can, out the different things that you can change. Yeah. Things like you can set defaults for how you want your folders to be displayed. That'll work on Windows. That'll work anywhere. In and general, do you, turn on, do, you, you, do you turn off desktop icons and have as little stuff on, this, on, the, on, the, on the desktop on the screen as possible? I mean, do you like to have a I kind of simple screen? You know screen? the answer to that. I do know the answer. It's called a leading question. I uh, I uh, I'm very uh, easily distracted. Huh? <laughs> um, and, and if there's anything there, I'm going to be sitting there and I'm going to be moving it, and oh, and then I'm going to have to go apply labels to it. And I, I think I think really getting uh, kind of getting your head around the idea of what your own particular problems are with this stuff. I'm very distractible, and then finding ways to fix that in little easy ways is a, is a terrific trick. I think you're really right. I think the computer is a natural distraction machine. I know writers who removed solitaire from uh, their computer because it's just too tempting instead of writing to play solitaire. And you, and it is true that almost always you can customize your machine to make it more useful, more of a tool, and less distracting. You're absolutely right. And I mean, one thing I should also mention, I don't think I'm talking here mostly about Mac stuff, but I think we're talking about concepts that extend way beyond this and onto the web. 
I mean, if there's anything most of us learned around Christmas time. Is that Skype doesn't work. <laughs> he disappeared. Well, we still hear your audio, so keep talking. That's your I picture. Think, I, think a lot of us, I think a lot of us learned that. <laughs> you know, with, uh, you, you, I, I see you, and I, I wonder this. I see you on uh, Twitter all the time, which is a kind of microblogging platform. Let's just see. I mean, Merlin, you post four or five times on Twitter. Is that one of the distractions that you have to deal with? So here he is, hot dogs, ladies. Uh, <laughs> How, what do you do about things like, I mean, you're always writing on here, right? Distraction? I, I'm sure I don't know what you mean. Well, <laughs> well, I'll just, tell you this, though. Let's look I at Hot Dog Ladies. He's, he, let's see, you've, you've uh, already today posted on Twitter, looks like at least a dozen times. Yes, but it was a mindful, a mindful distraction. I knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> so do and you I, suggest turning off things like Facebook and Twitter while you're trying to get something done? I totally agree. And yeah. I, think, I think, like I was going to say with Facebook, I mean, you don't want to wake up one day and suddenly discover that, you know, now this has been fixed, right, since, since this happened. But a lot of people woke up one day to discover the stuff they were buying on different sites was suddenly showing up on their friends list on Facebook. And so really yeah, being able, you, it's really incumbent upon you as a computer user increasingly to go out and kind of be your own uh, sort of defense attorney. Uh, with, with the stuff in your life, and that includes your time and attention. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. You have to kind of push things away so that you can get some stuff done. Now, I just want to let me see if I can find a, a picture of uh, Eleanor on here. Here, here <laughs> is. Are you saying my the, daughter's become a distraction? You have, yes, you have the cutest baby. That is Eleanor looking at the computer. Apparently, Merlin and his wife Madeline, and. Uh, Eleanor is is that uh, th that is the cutest baby in the world. I just want to say, yeah. Merlin's well, picture. So nice. You know, I mean, I'm sure Canada is just wall to wall with adorable kids. They're 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 a wonderful people. Maybe, but can they do this? She's she's winking. She. Wow. I've never seen a baby wink in my life. I wish my wife was here to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's great to talk to you. Merlin Mann is at 43folders.com, and he also has the funniest site, one of the funniest sites I've ever been to. It's Lists of Five. It's the number five, I-V-E-S.com, and there's new fives up there all the time. And Merlin, that's another distraction. You've got to stop doing that because it's distracting me. I'm sorry, Leo. I, as ever, I apologize. <laughs> Merlin, great to talk to you. Catch him at 43folders.com and on Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday on the Twit Network. More of your calls coming up as the lab continues right after this. Stay here. Welcome back to the Lab with Leo. I'm Kate Abraham, and my tip of the day is for all you Facebook users out there who want to know who's online when, so you can get instant messaging involved. So it's Facebook.com. The um, the app is actually called Who's Online for Facebook. What you do is once it's installed, you get the little icon photo. So for instance, I know that Sean is online right now. Uh, all of my friends here have been online, and what happens is the longer they're actually offline, the grayer they become. So for instance, I know that this gentleman here it hasn't been online for a while. Wow. So that is Who's Online for Facebook uh, from facebook.com forward slash app. So you fade out if you don't go, exactly. if you don't go, you it's slowly like stalking fade. on Facebook. I have to try that. Yeah, it's great. Actually, then you can update it and obviously it refreshes. So it's, it's a very yeah, cool little app. That's a really, that's a great thing. Yeah. I should check and see who my friends are online and who not. You know, I have almost 5,000 Facebook friends. That's your limit, isn't it? Yeah. So if you want to be my friend, you better hurry or to my stop Facebook. Or calling you out. <laughs> because, yeah. I, well, I don't know what happens then. I guess if somebody asks you after, you I don't know. You removed to put on, I think. Yeah. It's like a parking garage that's Absolutely. so full that you can't get in until somebody <laughs> leaves. And move someone in. But I could use that, so if somebody gets really faded out, then yeah. I could bump them. The only thing is, the more, obviously the more contacts you have, the longer yeah. that list is going to be. I can't use a lot of those apps because... you're going to be scrolling down <laughs> It just takes, it takes like an hour to build the, uh, build the image. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, let's get another caller on Fantastic. here. Fantastic. We are going to Sydney, New South Wales, and we have John. John, how are you? Great, Leo. How are you doing, mate? What can we do for you today? Well, yeah, I've um, recently moved into an apartment which has got uh, relatively thick concrete walls in the place, and uh, the, the wireless networking system I had in my house doesn't want to work too well anymore. And I've heard a bit about these um, network systems you can get which plug in through the you know, electrical wiring right. in your house. And I just I haven't, don't know about that, but I'm just wondering 
um, are they any good? Um, and the, you know, do they how well do they work? And if, if there's any system that they can mend. There's a long. This is called power line networking, and there's a long history of power line networking. Um, the pro I just noticed the picture. Great picture, by the way. I love that. Um, it, when they first introduced it, maybe a decade ago, uh, I was very skeptical. The idea is that you use the wiring in your walls. You've already wired your house. Uh, for power, for electricity, so every room has a plug. If you could only send network traffic over that, wouldn't that be cool? But there are all sorts of issues. I mean, you've got power on it, for one thing. You have to kind of isolate the data and the power. That power puts a lot of hum in there. There's a, an additional issue is that you actually can be turning your power lines into a broadcast station, broadcasting your data. So there were a lot of things that they had to, they had to solve. They actually have... Uh, to a great degree solve them and power line networking works pretty well the idea is uh, you'll have a base station that plugs into the wall it's called home pna and uh, and and then you can use every everywhere you want to use this power line networking you've got to plug into a a uh, the wall plug a special unit so you've got to buy a unit for every uh, every computer that you want to connect to the wall plug now I have to say I, uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't tried power line networking, but I know Sean knows a little bit about it, so I'm going to ask him about home PNA. When I first saw it and tried it, I wasn't unimpressed; it did not work. But I'm told now it works pretty well. You know, yes. assuming you don't have, for instance, big junction boxes in between two different rooms or a lot of splices. Yeah, have you tr have it. you tried it? What kind of speeds do you get? That kind well, of my my experience was pretty much the same as yours. When they first came out, you get something like 14 megabits, and it it didn't work Slow, really all that well. Yeah. Uh, the new batch is actually quite good. In fact, Sling, Sling Media has brought out something called the Slingbox Turbo, which is actually essentially home power line networking uh, oh, interesting. products to transfer your, your video signal from one end of the house to the other. Oh, that's so a good idea. At this point right now, it's, it's good enough that you can actually stream video through your home you know, electrical system, which that, that says it right there. Because so, video can be pretty intensive. How much bandwidth do you think you're getting on these things? They're saying about uh, 200 megabits per wow. second at this point. So well, that's it is, very fast. It's actually better than most wide yeah. 10, 100, yeah. definitely. Linksys sells these. They're fairly inexpensive. Here's the Linksys PLK 200 kit. Uh, and you can see you get a couple of adapters. You get the base station. And you'll have to buy more adapters as you want to add things to it. Um, it has encryption, which is important because, again, you're, believe it or not, broadcasting. <laughs> so somebody could, you know, pick up the signal of your data. Uh, this is a review uh, on CNET in which they give it a, a pr pretty uh, high review. I would suggest reading the reviews on the units you're thinking about before you buy, and I would especially suggest maybe going to Amazon. Uh, I don't know if you have an Amazon. Uh, I guess you must have an Amazon Australia, and uh, and uh, go there and read what people who have bought these kits what their experience has been. I find those to be really, really useful. CNET gives it a 7, 6 out of 10. Uh, I, it is, they point out, a little bit more net, uh, expensive, a little bit more bulky, but the point is it now works. And because you have your wiring all throughout your house, I mean, that's, that's, that's really great. I mean, you don't have to string wires. It's not wireless. Um, so you eliminate some of those yeah. issues with Wi-Fi. Uh, the one warning I'd give is something I discovered testing this a while back is mm -hmm. if you plug one into your house, you can actually pick up the signal from your neighbor's house. Right. Potentially. So That's why that encryption becomes right. very important. Yeah, so there's transformers every so often on the power lines between houses, but if you're between those, then people next door can sniff your... Uh, Sniff your pack. Excellent, excellent point. So uh, when, when they say data rates uh, to 200 megabits, that's, of course, the nominal maximum. Right, and that'll be shared. Your, your results may vary. Yes. All right, let's take a walk. Thank you, uh, Sean. I appreciate it. Let's take a walk on over to Ryan Yule Hello, for Leo. a Jewel. Yes, so we are on Windows, and we are doing geography. The program is called Cetera. Cetera. Now, uh, what it it's basically allows you to test your knowledge of countries, capitals, oh, provinces. Nice. You can choose different areas. we got North America, South America. So let's just check out Asia capitals and I'm going to do horribly because geography was not my strong point so it comes up and now we have to find Hanoi now I have no idea that's where. in Vietnam oh, now come on you need to go down down down, down, down right. somewhere yeah, up, 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 oh, 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 oh there you go maybe right there nope, nope oh, northern northern northern, oh, northern, northern oh, Vietnam northern there you Vietnam. go there you go there you go and uh, if you get too many <laughs> wrong it'll actually start pointing out so if I start see see this one right here starts flashing so it starts giving you hints if you're getting things wrong there's little quizzes so we can uh, we can go out here exit and we can do little quizzes 
pieces of like flags of the world even. So it's basically just for for people that want to like great. test themselves in geography, flags, yeah. countries. Because for provinces. kids who want to study geography, yeah. that's great. It's uh, for Windows only. It's and called it's Sotera. It's absolutely free. Of I like that. Free. Yes. Of course it's free. All of Yule's jewels are free. Yes. Where do we find those? Labwithleo.com. Free files. Yule's jewels. You find this. Many 160 more. plus great Something free like that. programs and yeah. tips. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Do you know where the capital of China is? Uh, that would be hmm, Beijing. Beijing? Yeah. Maybe? See, I'm not good yeah. at geography. I wasn't joking. We're going to go to China in just a bit. Chris Krug is here. He okay. is going to talk about using technology to bridge the cultural and political gaps between mm -hmm. the West and the East. It should be fascinating. But Very first, fascinating. one more chance to answer our quick quiz question of the day. Did you get this one? Do you know the answer? How much floor space was there for exhibits at the CES show, the big consumer electronics show, this year, January 2008 in Vegas? Hmm, what that? How big could that number be? Tell you what, go to the website. We'll talk about it when the lab continues. Welcome back to the lab. Before the break, we asked you how big was CES? It was big, baby. 1.85 million square feet, 2,700 booths, several hundred football fields. I mean, this thing is huge. Uh, really too big to cover even anymore these days. Chris Krug is here. He's the president of Rain City Studios. It's great to have you back. It's nice aptly it. named Vancouver-based web design firm. But you guys also do business in China. That's right. That's kind of interesting. How did that happen and why? Well, we opened an office in China of six months ago after being there about five times over the last couple of years. And we see um, a small R revolution taking place over there with uh, markets opening up to open source technologies and um, uh, innovation taking place on the internet that's coming from there as opposed to strictly from North America and Canada like like we've seen before. So it makes sense that a communist nation would love open source software. I don't know why, but it just seems like an, a natural. Um, they don't have the capitalist infrastructure for a big software industry, probably, right? Well, traditionally, the companies that were expanding into markets like Asia and stuff were big corporations with a lot of money it, and, it, and, and multinationals. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. an interest in trying to you know exploit that that new market and bring as much money out. What you're seeing now is a move from projects like Drupal and WordPress and other open source projects and just kind of initiatives as opposed to um, corporate led. See, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, especially in a country where uh, they don't have a lot of capital, they don't have a lot of money. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. I know that they were developing their own version of Linux, that they wanted to have kind of a, a, a default operating system, Chinese operating system. That makes a lot of sense. And these tools have, uh, have the ability to really open up and empower people to share ideas right. and to get their voice out there in a place where that type of stuff uh, traditionally has been something really difficult to do. And power is held by a few people. This, this really opens things up, oh, helps must share ideas, communicate. Yeah create their own content, connect with other people around the world. Did you get the sense that the, the Chinese government might be a little nervous about that, kind of opening up? I think they're very nervous about it. I mean, you still have to do very pragmatic things like register servers that go online in China. So every server that is run by someone in an ISP or home has a, has a certificate. The, the government knows that you have it out there. To, to hold meetings like the bar camps and the PHP users group and the Linux users groups that we participate in, you have to have a little certificate oh, interesting. that says that they know your meeting, they know who's in charge. So there's still a protectionist uh, right. culture. I think there's some fear. Do the participants, the Chinese participants, feel like they're being subversive, or do they feel like we're just trying to get more knowledge about what's going on in the world? I don't think they feel like they're being subversive in a political sense of the word. Yeah. I think that they feel like they're um, working around difficulties or routing around problem areas, kind of like right. the internet works. So right. I think they feel empowered, maybe more so than subversive. That's a good word. Yeah. yeah. Although I have to say, I feel subversive when I use open source. I feel like it's you know it's it's trying to open up the world a little bit. Uh, maybe it is more subversive to use open source in a capitalist economy than it is to use in a, in a centralized uh, communist economy. So uh, what, what is your sense of the, uh, uh, the skill level in, uh, in China? Uh, are these people good developers? They oh, don't? yeah, the skill level is very high. You see a, a really high... Um uh, group of, of mathematicians and computer scientists. Mm -hmm. These are people who are traditionally using their um, powers for quote unquote evil hacking and you know working around the system. But now with kind of the proliferation of open source software and some of the things that are going on over there, you see a lot of these people coming to the table and using their their skills for for good things. For interesting. Um, Do they participate in the open source community? I mean, are they starting to give back to the open source? Yeah, community? definitely. There's a site that we participate in called DrupalChina.org. It's a Chinese That's character right. version of Drupal.org. Right. You'll see a lot of Chinese members and contributors there. In fact. In 
fact, all of them are. Is a lot of the work initially localization, just making it Chinese? Yeah, a lot of that work has been done already in the case of Drupal, but yeah, I, I know Word, Word, WordPress is doing the same type of thing. Yeah. Um, there are local users groups. There's um, there's a Mozilla Foundation in China now. So great. These people are starting to self-organize and get together and realize, really kind of take advantage of the tools that are that are out there. How hard is it to get something like Drupal or Mozilla to support the Chinese language? I mean, it's. It's not. It's a kind of. It's 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 a di very different kind of structure, isn't it? Uh, technically, it, it's it's not that difficult. It really? requires supporting some of the newer standards like uh, UTF-8 and yeah. Unicode, as yeah. opposed to some of the older standards. But yeah. uh, most of the kind of uh, best practices, industry-leading software d does support uh, non-standard English character that's languages right. like Russian that's and Punjabi. So they, they must use a simplified Chinese because there's hundreds yeah, of thousands right. of characters right. in the Chinese yeah. language. So they use a simplified Chinese. So you've actually had bar camps. You've had Drupal camps. You've had these kind of unconferences in China. China? That's right. We've we've held uh, four bar camps. Bar camps are just these um, open source unconferences where there's no um, speaker and there's no crowd, but everyone's a participant. Yeah, Everyone participates. Everyone's expected yeah. to come talk about something they're passionate right. about. We've had several of those there. They've gone over really well. We had 200 people at the last. Oh yeah, I have a little picture here uh, from our last one in Shanghai. This is, this is uh, myself and Robert Scales with probably 60 or so of the people who came to. Uh, uh, Bar Camp Shanghai. Isn't that great? And, um, they're, they're, they're all young, aren't they? It's a, yeah, it's, students. it's a very it's a very young thing. I went to the there was a blogger con in, in China that I went and talked to about open source, and it was you know 500 people all all in university age. Look, there's a guy with a Firefox T-shirt. I love oh, yeah. that. That's probably considered pretty hip to be in oh, China. Yeah. You know, very much. That's yeah. really neat. So, uh, is Robert staying there? Is he living in, in China? Yeah, uh, CEO of Rain State Studios, Robert Scales, moved to Shanghai last October, That's and um, we've opened up an office there. We're nine folks there now, including Scales. So, eight eight local Chinese people. That's um, all of them speak English, bilingual. Uh, all of them are PHP developers and have been exposed to open source through the kind of efforts that we're working on over there. Now, so, I know you, for a long time, were using Drupal to kind of make it accessible to nonprofits and communities and so forth. Is that the kind of thing that's going on in China as well? Yeah, we're doing a couple things over there. We have our Drupal hosted service, which is right. for, you know, 20 bucks a month, people can come and get access to all the power of a, so of a Drupal site. Um, we're also doing some consulting over there. We're, right. um, there's a big expat online community that we're rebuilding right. called the Beijinger.com, rebuilding the Drupals. RainCitystudios.com is a place to go. Chris Krug is the president. He's also a great photographer. Go look at his Flickr site. Wonderful images. Uh, and uh, I just think it's very exciting how we're kind of like water. You know, it open source spreads everywhere and naturally and just and makes flowers grow. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, A final word coming up right after this. Stay right here. We're out of time. It always happens. It goes so fast, but we're so glad you were here. We Hope you found something of interest and, and learned something. And I hope you'll uh, want to come back, not only to watch the show, but to our website, because we've got lots of great stuff yeah, there. we have. The entire show basically is online with the show notes. The tech questions are there. So if you want to submit tech questions, fill in this form, and we'll get you on the show. Labwithleo.com. Yes, it is. Kate's got a blog there, too. You can read all of her, her life watch. story. Huh? You can watch online You as can well. watch? Yeah. I like to watch. Many yeah. people do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the purple show's over. Okay, we're done. Tomorrow, orange. Indeed. Okay, we'll be back in a bit. <laughs> Hope you will too. See you later. Bye-bye.